I want to just give you a little introduction to uh, what can be happening with uh, fruit or agriculture in general um, under climate change. And to start off, I just want to get everybody on the same page with basically a very quick intro into what the heck has been happening. So if you look at this slide, um, you can see the three hottest years in weather recording history, which has started in 1884, um, have been the last three years, okay? And you don't need to worry too much about these different lines. They correspond to El Nino or whether it's not El Nino. But um, you can see there's been a pretty much uh, um, uh, trend towards increasing temperatures, which started before 1960, but um, is reflected here uh, back to 1964. Uh, one thing that um, people sometimes think is that volcanoes um, could be behind the rising temperatures. And actually, um, you can see here, these are uh, yellow ones are volcano years. In fact, they tend to be cooler than average, so I just thought I'd, I'd point that out. Um, in fact, 15 of the 16 hottest years ever have been since the year 2000, and there have only been 17 years since 2000, right? So we're really racking up warm years even though it may not always be super warm right where we are. Okay, we had a real cold winter, but this was um, one of the coldest winters ever globally. Uh, so why is it getting so hot? Um, it's getting hot because current carbon dioxide levels are way out of the natural range. And I'll just um, uh, draw your attention to this left-hand panel for the, for the moment. Um, if we start now and we go back into the past, 400,000 years back into the past, we know what the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was way back then. Not because anybody was there, but because scientists drill um, down into the ice in the Antarctic and they can figure out what the carbon dioxide concentration was. And so what you see back in the past, and this actually goes even farther back, is carbon dioxide, here's the carbon dioxide concentration, goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And this corresponds to the ice ages, okay? Now, we know what causes those fluctuations, and I don't need to go into that now, but whatever it is that's causing these to go up and down, you notice the carbon dioxide concentration doesn't exceed 300 parts per million until very recently when it shot up. So if we look at a close-up of the, the last 2,000 years, okay, over on this slide, we can see, here's the ice core data, um, and the red is carbon dioxide. Things are percolating along until the late 1800s, and then carbon dioxide pretty much goes through the roof. So does methane and nitrous oxide, but we're not going to focus on that. So carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has some link to temperature, and um, we can see that, in fact, the temperature does track, here's temperature going up and down, Lots of variability in temperature. So it's hard to detect things as we are just standing around. Um, but you can see as carbon dioxide in the white increases, um, temperature on average has increased as well. Um, temperature does not track solar activity or volcanic activity, um, but it does track carbon dioxide. So how does carbon dioxide cause warming? Um, this slide basically is very, so simple. It has everything you need to understand about why um, uh, the, the planet is warming. And it's called the greenhouse effect, of course. Everybody has heard of it. Um, but uh, describing it, um, most people can't really describe it. So the idea is that the sun uh, is shining down. It warms the Earth up. Okay, well we know that. And the Earth then re-radiates some of that heat back as infrared waves. All you have to do is stand in a black parking lot in the middle of summer, you can see the heat shimmering up, right? That's infrared radiation headed back out into space. Um, but what happens is uh, in the atmosphere here, um, you can think of this blue basically as being the ozone layer, sort of the, the boundary of the bottom part of the atmosphere. And these little dots in here uh, are meant to be represent uh, molecules of greenhouse gas. Think carbon dioxide or methane, nitrous oxide. 
And what happens is when one of these uh, infrared waves, let's say, starts to go out into space and it bumps into a molecule of greenhouse gas, then that molecule kind of shakes a little bit, okay, not exactly the chemistry, but, and it bounces the infrared wave off in some random direction. So half the time that thing will come back towards Earth. And what happens is the more molecules of those greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the more bouncing around those infrared waves do before they're able to get out. So the more uh, higher the concentration of CO2, the longer it takes for the heat to escape. Same amount is coming in, so obviously the Earth is going to warm up. This is such a simple mechanism, and it's really all you need to know. People think, oh, climate change is super complicated. Yeah, there are details that are complicated, but this is what's driving it. And um, humans figured out that we can do a lot of great things if we dig up fossil fuels, which are basically carbon that has been in the earth for millions of years. We can do tons of things. We can manufacture, we can drive cars. And so, you know, back when we started that, nobody knew what was, what was happening. Um, now we know more, more carbon dioxide, um, la, uh, slower heat loss. So the interesting thing is most of the warming isn't staying in the air. It would be really hot if we didn't have the oceans. But in fact, 93 or so percent of the extra heat in the atmosphere from that slowing of heat loss has been absorbed by the ocean. And this is the link between the warming and the weather and many other things that are happening. Um, warmer ocean means there's more evaporation. Um, it's not like the ocean is steaming, you know, but you know when you start to warm up a pot of water, it will start to steam. More evaporation is occurring and the warmer air holds more water. So basically now the atmosphere is more humid. Okay? There's more water in, uh, vapor in the air. And this contributes to severe weather. So uh, this quote really sums it up, and I think it's, a, it's a, a, a great thing to hold in your mind. Global warming is contributing to an increased incidence of extreme weather because the environment in which all storms form has changed. We are in a new situation. We're not going back to the 1960s. We're now in a, a situation that's defined by uh, warmer air, warmer ocean, more water vapor in the air, as I described, and higher sea level, which of course is a big deal for Maryland because we have so much coastline. Um, this is called the new normal, okay? So for Maryland and, well, uh, this is true in general, but um, certainly in Maryland, we, we will have more severe weather. That does not mean climate change causes hurricanes, but the warmer ocean and warmer air does tend to make um, storms have a greater impact. Um, extreme weather will be more extreme and already is. There's more tidal flooding and storm surge along the coast. We have warmer winters, earlier springs, hotter summers, and that's what I'll be talking about in terms of impact on fruit. Um, heat waves last longer, also something to worry about with fruit. More rainfall comes as downpours now. Not as often do we get the soaking rains. A lot of times rain just um, comes down very, very quickly, and this can cause flooding. We have rainier springs and falls in Maryland than we used to have, drier summers. Um, so I'll give you a few of the most important impacts for fruit. Um, because of the warming temperatures, we have a longer frost-free season. And in the Northeast, okay, here we are, we're in the southern part of the Northeast, um, uh, we're having 10 days more frost-free than we used to have rel uh, on the average year between 1901 and 1960. Now, this is a pretty big change, nothing like California, right? But um, spring is definitely coming earlier, and this means there are fewer cold nights for the required chilling that a lot of the fruit crops require. Um, warmer winters mean earlier blooming. Um, and these data are from New York because uh, this gentleman, Dave Wolf, is a professor at Cornell. <coughs> um, and Nor uh, New York apples are now blooming on average eight days earlier than in the 1960s. I don't know about Maryland apples, uh, but I would suspect that a similar trend. Grapes in New York are blooming six days earlier. 
And what happens is, so we got a nice bloom here, then there's a cold snap. And here's a picture Dave took of blooming apple trees covered with snow. Um, this, I'll talk a little bit more about this late spring cold snap, but it can lead to freezing and fruit loss. And um, I'll discuss this a little bit more also. But siting, where you put new orchards, is, is now becoming more and more, more and more important. You don't want to put them down in protective little hollows where that cold air is going to collect. Um, you want to have uh, good air movement, et cetera. Um, so the warming, um, earlier warming, and then the lit, uh, freeze after that is called false spring. And we had one of those last year where it seemed like every day in February was about as warm as it is today. Well, we can't feel it, but it's going to be 70 or so. Um, and so fall spring is defined as February or early March that's very warm where a lot of plants break dormancy followed by a hard frost in usually in March or, or early April. And this is just a table that shows the sensitivity of um, apricots and peaches to temperature. And you all know this, right? Here are the different stages, apricots and peaches. and um, uh, early on, when they're just coming out of dormancy, uh, it, you know, it has to go down to one degree to kill 90% of them. But later on, if the buds are swelling and they're starting to bloom, then they can be killed by a frost. Still, it's a hard frost, 21 to 24 degrees, 25 degrees if they've bloomed. But that will then uh, kill or maim 90% or so of the plants. So it's a dangerous thing when the plants start to come out too early because we know that there will continue to be late spring frosts. But we can't always predict when they'll be. So in 2017, last year, um, it was the warmest February ever. And um, all the apricots in Maryland were lost, uh, as I understand. And the peaches in Maryland were sort of borderline. This is a picture. Did any of you have trouble with your peaches? She did, at least. Um, so this is a picture from Swan, uh, Swan Orchards, which I think is in Calvert County. Um, and they posted some really good pictures on their website. Here's some frozen uh, peach blossoms. And um, they show here, so here's the little peach, right? Um, even though the blossom is dead, they then did a little you know, sleuthing. And in some cases, you can dissect off the leaves and whatnot and see whether that peach is still there. And so they were very worried about the extent of their losses. But as it turned out, the season worked out OK for them in the end. Now, it's the timing of these frosts that is difficult. We can't predict whether it'll be, you know, the I think it was the 4th through 6th of March or something last year when the frost occurred. A little later, a little earlier has a big difference. It makes a big impact. So we know warmer spring, there is this danger that the, that the plants will come out too early and then they'll be um, hammered. So um, picking a good site for any new orchards is very important. There's a great um, uh, a set of resources on frost protection at the Cornell fruit site, okay? And so if any of you are interested, you could take this down, or I guess the video will be available later. Um, there's a, a lot of information there that might be useful to you. Uh, another thing that's occurring is that the nighttime temperatures are rising faster than the daytime temperatures. And these pictures, these graphs just came out this week, in fact. Um, this is for Baltimore. Uh, the nighttime, the uh, average minimum temperature is 1970 to 2017. And again, weather is variable, right? So it's all over the place, but the trend is increasing with the average starting out about two degrees centigrade and increasing. Hagerstown started out minus five degrees centigrade is increasing. Um, Salisbury, we don't see that there has been an increase so far, but it started out around five degrees centigrade, already warmer than these two even are at, at this point. So it turns out to be much harder to accumulate chill hours uh, for the fruit trees that need to, to accumulate them than it has been in the past. And again, last year was a huge problem for growers in Georgia. Um, 
Most Georgia peaches evidently need about 650 hours, chill hours. They got less than 500 hours. And um, Dormex, I don't personally know anything about this product, but it's a um, growth re regulator that some people apply when there haven't been enough chill hours. Did any of you use that or heard of it? Okay. Um, this uh, farmer in Georgia evidently used it, but it didn't help that much. And so they wound up with a lot of these really, you know, awful looking uh, peaches because there wasn't um, the appropriate cue for the plant to produce the, uh, the right uh, level of, of, of uh, flowering and, and fruiting. Then, okay, they kind of had accepted that. The fall spring that we had last year wiped out the rest of the crop. The Georgia peach crop was pretty much shot last year. Um, according to NOAA, South Carolina and Georgia lost $1 billion in peaches in 2017. North Carolina lost their entire blueberry crop. Now, I know maybe you probably don't care about those other states, but the point is that we don't know when these frosts are going to occur. And so next time it could be Maryland that loses the peaches um, or that loses the blueberries. So this is something to be thinking about. We've had two really big fault springs in the last five years, 2017 and 2012. Okay, effects of warmer winters and earlier springs. Well, insects are loving it, right? Um, they have better overwinter survival. They don't get knocked back as much in the winter. They come out earlier in the spring. There are, in many cases, a lot of insects, you, you, you already know this, but insects live their life at a speed that is determined by the temperature around them, right? So when it's warmer, they live their lives at a faster speed, and they can sometimes cram in another generation. And so some insects are having more generations a year. Many insects are expanding their ranges northward, which means we will be getting um, some insect pests. We already are that from the south. And so it's very important to be vigilant and either yourself or someone who works for you, send them out there earlier than you think you need to, to scout for insects so that you can be prepared to control them. And expect the unexpected because new insects are popping up and some years uh, certain insects will be a problem, other years others. The other problem here with insects is that if your plants are stressed already, okay, they're more susceptible to both insect damage and disease. So things start to pile up. These graphs show the way that temperature has changed in Maryland since 1950. Just look at this one first, because I have to explain how the graphs work. I don't know why Noah put the, put the graphs out in this confusing format, but there it is. This is temperature. And each one of these bars is the average temperature for a five-year period, okay, from 1950 to 2014. And the way you look at it is the, the average over the whole period is this line, you know, the baseline. And if the bar is below that line, it means that five-year period was cooler than the average between 1950 and 2014. And if the bar is above that baseline, it means that five-year period was warmer than the average. So to see the trends, you just sort of take a look over the whole period. And in this case, we notice that early in the period, most of the bars are below that average, which means the early part of the period was cool, and then the later part of the period, the bars are above, so warmed up. The average temperature in Maryland warmed up. Um, uh, the number of days over 80 degrees, same thing. Early in the period, um, the, the average number of days was less than the, uh, than the overall average for each five-year period. Toward the end, more days over 80 degrees. More days over 100 degrees, okay? And I'm sure you know, many of you will realize that this just from your experience. But again, it's very hard to sort of uh, experience a, a small rise in average temperature because of the amount of noise that we get from weather. Number of nights over 70 degrees, big increase. Number of nights over 80 degrees, big increase. And this um, has a huge impact on um, a lot of vegetable crops, at least, like tomato. Tomato will not pollinate properly if the, if the temperature, daytime temperature is too high and the flowers and fruits fall off of a lot of vegetables if the nighttime temperatures are too high. One thing that does happen to fruit with fruit is um, when we get a good hot day and the sky is clear and there's just lots, of, lots and lots of sunshine, um, 
fruit scalds. So here's apple scald and strawberry. Um, there's different kinds of scald. This happens in raspberries. I saw this in my own raspberries in my little garden, right? And I thought, well, what the heck is this? It's, it's um, sun scald. Um, this is an apple tree that actually was, um, had scald on the trunk and then it was weakened and it, it became susceptible to a disease. So as I said, when you have one stressor acting, then other things, pests and disease in particular, ramp up because they love those stress trees because those stress trees don't put out as much insect defense. Um, one thing you can do to help with scald, not on strawberries obviously, but on apples is put, you know, the surround on which is that clay spray. Um, and that, that is effective. Um, I included this picture down here of um, watermelon because watermelon is very susceptible to ozone damage. And ozone um, is increasing, uh, uh, unfortunately, it's part of air, the air pollution um, from electricity generation. And um, I saw this again in my own garden on beans and I, I, I thought, what is this damage? You know, what is this bronzy? I didn't recognize it as a disease or an insect. It turned out it was ozone damage. So, um, have any of you seen that on, any of you grow watermelons? Maybe seen that? Okay. Um, high temperature impacts. Um, when it's really hot out, plants um, respire more to cool, and so they lose carbon dioxide and carbon when they do that. That cuts into the amount of carbon they have available to, you know, to, to put into fruit. And there's also a reduction in pollen production um, in high temperatures, and, and in the success of pollination, that is uh, pollen tubes, this is mostly known from tomato, but the pollen tubes don't grow properly if it's too warm. Um, when it's hot and clear, we also, obviously there's more evaporation, the plants are sucking more water out of the soil, and we can get into a drought situation. Even though Maryland is not expecting or has not experienced so far reduced rain, the increased temperature has sucked more water out of the soil, so it's led to drought conditions more often. Um, apples can drop their fruit off, etc. Now, this is interesting. Um, uh, insects love hot weather, right, most of them, and codling moth, um, no friend of fruit growers, um, is on the verge, evidently, of adding another generation, just what you need, right, uh, more codling moths. Um, high temperatures at night can be problematic for apples um, because it turns out the pigment that makes the apples red requires a relatively cool nighttime temperature. So here's an experiment that was uh, just published last year and this is a sort of regular apple. This is what it's supposed to look like. This is the same variety of apple grown under a, a cooler than normal condition in a greenhouse, right? Produced a lot of the red pigment. But this is that same apple grown in, you know, a, an elevator nighttime temperature and you don't even see the little blush that you that you would expect to find on the apple and so this is um, probably not very good from a, a marketing standpoint if people expect the apple to have a certain amount of pigment and, and they don't have it then that's not uh, probably too great um, adapting to increased temperatures well as temperatures continue to increase right what are we going to do um, it is important to uh, recognize that plant breeders are out there industriously working, even as I speak, to breed more heat tolerant varieties. Now, in places like Maryland, we can start to use varieties that are already being used farther south, um, and that will get us a little bit of, of way. But the ultimate is going to be to have uh, better vari varieties that better, better tolerate the heat. Um, you can build shade. This is a, a picture of lettuce. I know you don't care about lettuce, but in the small scale, you can shade things. Um, not very practical in, the, um, in a larger setting. Um, mulching, uh, people are now re um, recommending that for the kinds of fruits that you do mulch, don't use black mulch because it gets broiling under the black mulch and that, that raises the soil temperature. White mulch or silver mulch um, is being recommended for some of the, the, the um, crops you mulch. Um, again, for annual vegetables, you can stagger the planting dates because you can start planting some of those earlier. And 
Um, and that will kind of let you hedge your bets, right? Because you might be able to get that harvest off before it gets too hot. Um, and that's just plant earlier in the spring. Um, these guys, I don't, uh, oh, I, did mention, I didn't mention this. This is a, an orchard, again, it's in British Columbia, Canada, but they had a terrible experience with um, sun scald. Uh, it's normally very cool up there. And they went to the effort and expense to install evaporative cooling, um, which cost a lot of money, but now is saving them boatloads each year. Okay, so that's a kind of extreme um, um, adaptation to go to, but it's not unrealistic that that would pay off in the long term. It did for these people. That's just an example. Um, summer drought. Uh, apples don't look too swinging when they're grown up in drought. Um, if you can add irrigation, you probably all irrigate. Everybody's irrigating their apples already, right? Drip, drip irrigation. Um, uh, I've read that it can be useful to add drainage, and again, I don't know if this is for, so much for vegetables, but add drainage to counteract those spring and fall floods, right? And then send that drained water to the pond. I don't know how much, um, that, how well that would work. But it is absolutely clear that building up the soil is very, very helpful because the more healthy your soil, the more organic matter, uh, is, it's going to hold more water. And yet at the same time, it's going to drain better when there's um, a, a big flash flood. So having healthy soil is, is really great. Mulching, um, I understand you can't mulch under fruit trees like this um, because of mice. Lynn Moore told me that of, of Larry Land Farms up in Howard County. Um, last year I'd forgotten it, but um, I, was think, I was trying to recall that during Dave's talk. Obviously, it would be nice to be able to mulch down there, but if you've got mice down there chewing on your trees, that's not a good thing. Um, and there, everybody in an orchard, anyway, is already growing st stuff between um, the rows. Um, obviously, drip irrigation is the way to go. This is a big waste of water. Um, and again, most of you are already using that. Now, I talked about drought, but the flip side of that is that more of our rain is coming down as downpours. Um, and if you want to have a number, in fact, this is where the Northeast has increased more than the rest of the country. Um, 71% uh, more of our rainstorms are coming down as fast as downpours. Um, this can uh, produce a flash flood. And if you get water moving overland, right, from uh, property to property, this can contaminate your fields. Maybe not a worry if you've got a fruit tree where the, the fruit is up here, but if you've got stuff down in the field, it can be contaminated with toxins, bacteria, etc. Um, a lot of excess water can stunt or kill the plants, increase disease, it can delay planting or harvest. Um, and here again in that same format is what's happened with rainfall in Maryland. Um, most of the bars here below, um, uh, back toward 1950 are below the line, but a big increase in number of rains over four inches. Um, the seasonal is a little bit more variable, but um, more rainfall in the spring, about the same in the summer, and more rainfall in the fall. So there's a change in the seasonal um, pattern of rainfall. Um, and then this is just my last slide. Um, so more flooding is already occurring and will continue to occur in the spring and the fall. And as I said, one way to get around that is to improve soil health so you get infiltration. Um, also, um, you can use cover crops, again, maybe not so pertinent um, to, uh, to orchard situations, more pertinent perhaps to um, annual fruits that are grown. Um, but evidently there are flood resistant rootstocks of various uh, fruit trees which you know, might be useful if every place on your farm is sort of boggy. But again, siting the new orchards is going to be key. Um, and diversifying crops is something that's useful for every farmer um, in the next, in the next uh, decade or two. Because some years, some crops are not going to do great and other crops will. If you're diversified, then that, that hedges your bets a little bit. Um, so I, I have a few handouts in the tables on the other side of this wall. Um, I unfortunately have to, going to have to leave after the break, but I'm more than happy to answer questions you know, during the break, or you can email me anytime.